joining me here at Burt's Books, where this time we are going to be taking a look back at Graham Masterton's 1980 political horror crossover novel, The Hell Candidate. Uh, this book was originally published in Britain by Corgi Books in 1981 under the pen name of Thomas Luke. I remember it from the time. A copy was passed around certain members of my age group at school and my abiding memories of it apart from that uh, eye-grabbing artwork are the vividness of the sex scenes which included some very descriptive passages concerning a, a broad-minded redhead among the cast and the other abiding image that stayed with me over the decades is that of uh, the horned one's insatiable <laughs> Masterton explains in his new foreword that at the time of this book's writing in 1980, he and his wife were seriously considering moving to the United States from Britain. Uh, he'd already pitched most of his stories in the States uh, and was spending a certain amount of time both in Connecticut and in California, where he got to know Ronald Reagan's elder brother, Neil, which gave uh, Masterton the opportunity to observe the campaigning process up close and to witness Reagan's persuasive public manner and his ability to win over any audience. And this plant the seeds in Masterton for this story. His publishers liked the idea of this story, but since they were trying to push Masterton at the time as something other than a horror writer, uh, they suggested they pitch it under another name, hence Thomas Luke. The book went on to be a great success, but uh, really it's just one title of a long, long list by this author, until the ascendancy of Trump, at which point this book suddenly enjoyed an unexpected second wind. This edition uh, is a reprint from 2018, radically revised cover artwork, and though the face on him there appears to be, it looks to me more like a recent John Travolta, uh, but the hair, there's a definite uh, lacquered blondness going on there, uh, which seems to be pointing us to the suggestion that uh, the hell candidate in some way uh, was an anticipation or a prediction of Trump. The story is narrated from the point of view of Jack Russo. I'm not sure if that's a joke on fellow horror writer John Russo, but anyway, the story is told from the perspective of after the event, uh, with its demonic subject uh, now a troubling figure in the past. Uh, Russo recalls in the opening chapter the moment in which he realised that prospective candidate uh, Hunter Peel uh, was going to go on to win the presidency. Peel is described at this stage of his career as a calm, mature figure with the long lean gaze of the dedicated pioneer. This does seem to blow the Trump thing out of the water immediately. Russo goes on to explain that while these qualities did peel great credit, uh, it was something rather darker that emerged during the days of his campaigning, which sealed the deal for Hunter Peel. OK, let's get it out of the way at this point. Um, Hunter Peel, our prospective devil nominee, uh, just happens to be a Republican. He wasn't, according to the forward, he wasn't specifically based on Reagan. It's possible, in fact, that Nixon was more of a reference point. Russo first encounters Hunter Peel, a Colorado senator who's on the trail as a nominee. Uh, Russo, at the time, is a fairly naive 29-year-old working as a reporter for the Butte Independent. He finds himself instantly taken with Hunter Peel's natural charm, and Peel, in turn, is quite impressed with Russo, uh, enough to offer him a job as a staffer on the spot. Um, eight months down the line, and Russo is installed in the campaign headquarters, a dilapidated 10-bedroom colonial-style house in Connecticut. Uh, known as Allen's Corners. Although the campaign is going well, uh, the place is giving Russo an uneasy feeling. He's already fancying he's hearing odd sounds at night. This is probably exacerbated by the presence of some rather bizarre, uh, paganistically styled statues outside in the orangery. However, there are fringe benefits to Jack being in this location, namely Jennifer Dwyer, a member of the domestic staff who's red-headed and it soon turns out the open-minded sort, and we're shortly treated to a fairly descriptive sex scene. Uh, these things do leave an impression on a 14-year-old reader. However, this doesn't dispel Russo's heebie-jeebies for very long. He wakes up in the night to the impression that Jennifer has somehow ossified into one of the statues from the garden. Uh, she seems to be staring at him with blank white eyes. The moment passes, uh, she's awake and her normal self, and Russo starts to wonder whether he is losing his marbles. Back on duty that day, Jack notices a change in Hunter Peel's demeanour. Uh, he seems to have transformed from the down homey pioneer type into a foul-mouthed, foul-tempered 
warmonger. Your staff are naturally alarmed by this. Uh, they're already doubting their boss's mental health as he rants about, let my will take the place of reason. But they feel committed to their task uh, and they so they carry on, uh, hoping to be able to rein in his excesses throughout whatever uh, internal crisis he's undergoing. It turns out that while Peel's morals might have done an overnight about turn, his personal charm and persuasiveness are still very much intact. But he's also acquired some new talents. Uh, when his staff summoned the doctors, Hunter psychokinetically bursts open the doctor's medical bag so that scalpels fly in all directions. From this, Peel strides off into a public appearance, at which he somehow conjures mass hallucinations of rolling wheat fields, followed by uh, thundering masses of B-52 bombers. Uh, it's bewildering, terrifying, but ultimately convincing, and it seems to guarantee Peel's success as a nominee. And so Hunter Peel's staff are caught in a dilemma between his sudden and very obvious moral repugnance uh, and his unstoppability as a candidate. Uh, Russo performs some uncomfortable internal gymnastics in order to justify his choice to himself. He reasons that uh, if Hunter's uh, regulars desert him, that he'll then fill the void uh, with lower political riffraff, and he plumps to stick with him. Incidentally, this element of the story struck me as quite insightful. You know the man is a snake, but he's your snake, and he's a winning snake. <laughs> so we can tackle the problem of executive conscience when we come to it. Still, the campaign races ahead. It's soon apparent that Hunter Peel is willing to fight dirty to get what he wants. This includes the use of his psychokinetic powers to take any potentially threatening parties out of circulation uh, and also to inflict an attack of the runs on one of his rivals during a live televised debate. Meanwhile, events in Alan's corner continue to get weird. Sneaking a peek into Hunter's room late one night when he fancies he's heard weird noises, Russo thinks he witnesses his boss um, morphing into some bristly pointy-tailed animal who's ravishing a strange woman who appears to be the carnal representation of uh, one of the statues, uh, a dancing nymph who appears to have been modelled in flagrante with some unidentified beast of which only the hooves remain. Peel explains all this away as a bit of groupy action due to Mickey's supposed frigidity before they hit the campaign trail and a mysterious large packing case accompanies Peel to every location. His new political gambit being that he fancies reopening the Vietnam War. Bizarrely this kind of chest beating seems hugely appealing to a large section of the public. None of Peel's extremes seem to harm his campaign at all. Um, his next wheeze is a blatant war against the poor policy, a keep him in the ghetto initiative uh, which comes with distinct racist overtones. This appears to clinch him his party's confidence as a presidential nominee, although it's clear that they're leaning that way less through sympathy to his policies and more down to the certainty that he's going to win. While they're out on the trail, Rousseau and Jennifer's curiosity about what's in Hunter's packing case gets the better of them, and they blag their way into his suite while he's out. Um, as you might have guessed, uh, it's the statue of the nymph from the garden at Alan's Corners in there, in all its erotic detail, uh, along with some filthy, unidentifiable animal hide. The statue's curiously uh, intimate anatomy uh, yields a pair of broken-off stone dicks, uh, which, <laughs> as if from some marble two-on-one action, these are items which Jennifer finds weirdly mesmerising. While they're arguing about the cocks made of rock, Hunter returns and catches them. He's strangely calm about their intrusion. He doesn't demand Rousseau's resignation, and he makes a gift of the two stone artefacts to Jennifer. Uh, they're drilled through so she can wear them as a pendant tucked into her cleavage. Peel's TV appearance the following day is a sensation, successfully pushing all the buttons and playing to the collective national hopes, dreams, fantasies, uh, and also the paranoias and prejudices. He's promising a new Wild West, protected by hordes of B-52s, where rosy-cheeked families could play happily and safely ever after, untouched by communism, muggers, cockroaches, or tax rate schedule Y. Russo relates how they were all pleased with Hunter's success on this day, adding... Whatever you think of him now, 
You can't blame us. Of course, not everyone is delighted with him. Representative Leonard Oliver declares on a matter of conscience that he feels duty-bound when confronted with the satanic nature of Peel's platform to contend him as a nominee. Well, that is his card marked. Um, The second section of the book starts with uh, an assassination attempt on Peel by Duke Willits, a 24-year-old black guy from Arkansas who is resolutely uncharmed by the new Wild West and having witnessed one of Peel's TV appearances, takes it upon himself to rid the world of this wannabe dictator. The attempt happens in the street in Portland and before Willits has even managed to take proper aim, Peel's finely tuned self-preservation instincts and his psychokinetic defence mechanisms literally turn Duke Willits inside out. This, of course, has happened in front of many witnesses. It's impossible to rationalise, but it leaves Hunter's staff in no doubt that something extraordinarily disturbing is going on with their boss. Peel's attitude towards his rival, Oliver, is equally merciless, although perhaps a bit less public. Peel browbeats Russo into collaborating on some dirty tricks. Uh, He's to travel to LA and contrive to make friends with Oliver's daughters while they're on vacation there uh, and to plant a package which supposedly will contain a large quantity of cocaine um, in their apartment before dropping a dime on them with the authorities. Against his better judgment, Russo goes along with this. Uh, Peel's weird psychokinetic powers have, for the duration of this stunt, transformed Russo's appearance to that of David Soul. Cloaked in this bizarre psychic disguise and calling himself Rudy Seltzer, Russo pulls it off, um, even managing a bit of romantic frisson with Gail Oliver before making the drop and getting out of there. Turns out the package didn't contain cocaine after all, but Jennifer Stone Dix, which acts as a sort of portal for Hunter in his incarnation as the Great Beast uh, to materialise in the girl's apartment and to uh, defile them both. It's a pretty horrific incident, uh, very graphic described uh, which Russo stumbles in on and we get the confirmation of what the statue hinted at Um, I'll remember this aspect from the first time I read the book Um, the devil indeed has got a double dick bow before me and kiss my two manhoods he blares at Russo Um, he doesn't take him up on that Um, technically aren't they goat hoods Uh, you can try doing a search on it I don't recommend you do from work Possibly it's an invention of Masterton's, but anyway, it's a pretty disturbing sequence all in all, and it results in uh, both Gail and Faye Oliver um, lacerated, violated and dead. On his return, Russo, no longer Rudy Seltzer, confronts Peel in his human form uh, about all this, but he's still coerced into sticking with the politician. Um, The loss of his daughters, of course, has knocked Oliver out of the race, so the path is clear uh, for Peel as the presidential candidate. Uh, This is clinched at a party convention, at which Peel again summons up an intoxicating mass hallucination involving ranks of War of Independence drummers, uh, one troop of them being playboy, model grade and majorettes in tight costumes, um, a living projection of the delegate's own unexpressed fantasies. Russo's own conscience is by now finally becoming hard for him to ignore, and after meeting with the inconsolably bereaved Senator Oliver, uh, Russo uh, undertakes to uncover just what has happened to his boss, um, the trail leading him to the dark, disturbing history of Allen's Corners, events which happened there over a century previously, of which the remnants, as embodied uh, by those mysterious garden statues, have reactivated dark forces during Peel's residency there. These revelations are the beginning of Peel's undoing. I won't spoil the ending for you, but the narrative is plainly from the perspective of the aftermath of such events with Peel being a bad memory. Let's just say in the horror laws of physics, it's usually down to the Catholic Church to uh, resolve such matters. The ending and Peel's come up and uh, pretty preposterous, but uh, the book does hook you in there and it's fairly entertaining. Uh, there you have it. America and the world have had a pretty narrow squeak with Armageddon. All in all, it's a pretty involving, uh, generally entertaining slice of 80s horror, balancing political intrigue, supernatural creepiness, fairly frequent sexual titillation. Uh, It's hard to forget that Masterton used to write manuals on that subject, being offset with some rather more disturbing elements. Masterton has proved a pretty reliable writer on the horror front. Of course, the context of this book's uh, recent reappearance um, is the notion that uh, he might in some way have uh, anticipated or predicted the drumph. 
That seems a bit yes and no. Um, while the recent administration have not been shy on military spending, uh, the extremity of uh, Hunter Peel's new Cold War or return to Vietnam um, haven't exactly been played out in reality. Um, this wasn't the first book to place the satanic element close to the heart of American politics. Stephen King's The Stand comes to mind. Uh, in fact, Trump has uh, sometimes been compared to the Randall Flagg character in that book. Um, the Omen trilogy uh, places the Antichrist at the heart of the American and corporate and political establishment. I believe uh, Damien is the ambassador to Britain in the final film. Now, it's noticeable that uh, certain elements of the narrative do seem rather familiar, uh, and not just with regard to US politics either. The capitulation of a party's conscience when they think they've got a winner on its hands, uh, that, of course, is recognisable. The willingness of uh, both a party and a public jaded with conventional mainstream politics to be coerced into uh, enabling an unstable, irrational, vulgar sleaze of a man. Um, history has seen that before, of course, but it does sort of resonate. Hunter Peel's policies of social division, of course, are also recognisable. Uh, central enclaves of our major cities uh, where the prices are so damn high that only the wealthy can afford to live there. So in some respects there's no denying that Masterton has been quite insightful and canny in his observations. But as far as this book being an out-and-out -out prediction of the drumpf, not quite. You can't quite get past the aspect that Hunter Peel turned bad overnight, subject to external forces beyond his control. Previous to that he'd been an agreeable middle ground sort of candidate, possibly even a national unifier, with an unforced level of personal charm, and it's kind of hard uh, to quite We're lower that than with. the world. Uh, does Satan want the president's soul? He's probably got better taste. <laughs>